David Lindsay's Satire of the Three Estates is uh, probably the best known Scottish play uh, of all time and also probably one of the most important plays produced in Britain before the modern period, uh, even including Shakespeare. So it's, it's a monumental play in Scottish dramatic tradition. It's called The Three Estates because um, the three estates are the, the body that are gathered together as a parliament. When a king calls a parliament in the early modern period, he summons his nobles, the lay nobility, uh, the bishops and abbots who are the spirituality, and the burgesses, the merchants, who are the kind of urban aristocracy. And they are the three estates of Parliament. So Lindsay's play is built around the idea of a gathering of Parliament to put together, or to put right, a series of uh, acts that will put right what's wrong with Scotland. So that's why the play is called The Three Estates. And it's a very long play, and a lot happens in it. But it starts with a king whose name is Rex Humanitas. And he is very young and impressionable. And the point of the first half of the play is who will influence him and what kind of king will he be? First of all, as I say, he's very young, and the first people he meets are his courtiers, whose names are Wantonness, Placebo, and the third one, Solace. And they suggest that what's good for a, good young, a young man is to have a good time. So they invite Sensuality, who's a beautiful woman, uh, to court, and obviously the king falls under her influence, and spends most of his time in his bedchamber, as do the rest of the court under the influence of sensuality, so it's a lustful, corrupt court. And while the king is neglecting his duties, then a trio of other vices, who are flattery, uh, and two others, the falsehood and deceit, they come in um, disguising themselves as clerks and a friar. So they come in as, as a kind of good government, but they're not. They're a vicious, foolish government. And being sensuous, the king accepts them in. So, when the people he should be uh, aligning himself with, who are chastity, verity, and good counsel, turn up, uh, they're dismissed, they're banished, and then put into the stocks and uh, kept away from the court. That's how things are in Scotland until uh, divine correction appears as a ministering angel from God, a great winged, um, the archangel Michael, uh, the winged, crowned creature with a sword who brings correction to Scotland, and he banishes all the vices from the court, sensuality first and then the others, who scatter. And he announces that in the second half of the play, there'll be a calling of the Parliament of the three estates. So we end the first half with the court purged of vice, but the country itself still corrupt. The second half of the play, if you're, if you're still holding with me, <laughs> is uh, when the attention turns to the rest of Scotland. It begins with this wonderful iconic moment when the estates gather for a parliament, but they come in backwards, walking backwards, a symbol that they're being misled by the vices who have corrupted them. And this is a great shock. You know, the three estates of Scotland walking backward, everyone says, what's going on? And under the authority of correction and good counsel, the king, Rex, begins the parliament. But no sooner has he done that than the poor man, uh, John the Commonweal, comes in and starts protesting that Scotland has been ground under by vices, particularly the church, for many years, and the king has neglected them, and therefore Scotland is crooked and dressed in rags. They've been brought low. And so the second half of the play is putting that right, that John the Commonweal and his friend, the pauper, the poor man, protest about all the things that the church has done wrong, all the taxes, all the corruption, all the, the lustful private vengeances that the, the clergy practice against the poor. And one by one they're put right, and the clergy are purged of the vices and the Catholic. Uh, it turns out that all the vices are centrally Catholic doctrines and practices. So the church is reformed, uh, the realm is put right, John the Commonweal is brought into Parliament and given a place there, so his voice will be heard. And everything seems all right, the vices are hanged, and there's a long reading out of the Act of Parliament. But just at that point, Lindsay then brings in another figure we haven't seen before, Folly, who gives a sermon that says all of Scotland are fools. Everybody in the audience is a fool, the king is a fool, everyone at court is a fool. So we're left with this moment of kind of unfinished business where everyone is described as foolish and to blame and responsible for what's gone wrong and by implication for putting it right. So the play is constantly kind of offering solutions which then prove not quite to be the answer. In the first half, the point is to make the king a good king, 
But the second half of the play says, well, that's not enough. You need the whole of the country to be responsible and purged and working for the good of Scotland if it's going to work. So we have the Parliament. And then at the end of that, the pauper says, well, that's all very well, but you make, you've got to make sure you do it. So then the attention turns to the audience, and it says, well, if Scotland is going to be purged of vice and turned into a country where the Commonwealth is well established, then it's all our responsibility. So it kind of leaves the audience to blame at the end and responsible. So a complicated play and a long one. 